And I like that song. It's important that we never forget. That we never forget that everything goes to Calvary and from Calvary to an empty tomb. And those things make all the difference in the world to who we are and, and to what our future holds for us. I sang some songs today that, that say things like, I must tell Jesus. I must tell Jesus everything, all of my trials, everything about me, I must tell Jesus. We sang a song that said, heaven came down and glory filled my soul. About the incredible presence of Christ here among us and walking among us. And we, we sang a song that actually fits so well with our scripture today that, that just simply says you are worthy. Worthy of worship and worthy of praise. We continue our series in John chapter 4. We're in the, in the gospel according to John, this series we call Believe, and, and today we go into the fourth chapter of this gospel. We're going to read the first 26 verses of the fourth chapter as our scripture for today. We're going to read uh, from a little different version today. We're going to read on the screen and hear from the English Standard Version, but you can find it in whatever version you brought with you and in the New King James in the, in the pews in front of you. You can also find it on the back of your bulletin for today. John 4, verses 1 through 26, a story that many of us who've grown up in the church have heard, and yet we're going to look at it anew today. It reads as follows. Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee. And he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman from Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. And Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go Call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You're right in saying, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. May God bless the reading of his word. Lord, we come today to this incredible story. And may we find in it truth about living water. May we find in it truth about being in your presence. May we find in it truth about worship, and more than anything, may we find in it truth about you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We've been working through the gospel according to John. We just wrapped up last week chapter 3. And chapter 3 is one of those chapters we all think we know really well because we know one verse in the middle of it really, really well. 
But we took a time and we looked through everything else. And I just want to remind you of a couple things from chapter 3 before we move into chapter 4. And I'm going to remind you of the musts. We listed these last week. Sinners must be born again. Jesus said this to Nicodemus in 3.7. The Savior must be lifted up. He talked about how it must be lifted up like Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness in 3.14. And in 3.30, we found these great words that came from John that said, It's the sovereign, the Lord must increase and the servant must decrease. These were all truths that we found in the third chapter of John. And the greatest of all, and we found this not once but twice if we were paying attention. Whosoever believes, lives. That's a pretty good thing. That's a pretty good thing. And it's something, there's this innate desire within us from the time that God created mankind to enjoy an eternal fellowship with God. In fact, when God created the world and created Adam and Eve, and He said, this is it, in our image, in our likeness, the whole purpose of it was that to enjoy fellowship with God forever. And to be there. And man separated that. And through mankind's sin, that there, there's a chasm that's existed. But there's been this yearning ever since to restore that chasm. To restore that relationship with God. And this story today is really about that. As we go into the Gospel of John, into the fourth chapter, this is a story that has so many components to it. In fact, when I originally was looking at this, I was going to talk about it from the standpoint of outcast. How Jesus just accepts all kinds of people from all different walks of life. But as I looked at it and studied it even more, I realized what's really underlying the whole story is there's this desire within this woman that is unmet in her life. And she doesn't even know what it is or how to put it into words, but Jesus does. Jesus does. And there are, as always, as I've been doing recently, I like to look for some simple truths that are in there, things that we can grab hold of, things that we can hold on to. And I think there are some within this story as we look at this woman trying to find satisfaction, trying to find something in her life. You know, Mick Jagger sang it years ago, I can't get no satisfaction. Well, Mick, if you don't know Jesus, you're never going to have it. You know, you got to get there because it's just a deep down desire to have something that fills us up fully and completely. But as we look at the truths of here, one of the first things that's going to jump to us in this story is that Jesus' love, Jesus' love for people has no geographical boundaries. This is going to jump right off at the very front of this story and our, and our satisfaction, our desire to live within this relationship with God. We have to understand that there's no geographical, there's no national boundaries, there's nothing that exists that can separate us from the love of Christ. Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee. And, and, and we're not going to spend a lot of time with this, but I'll just point this out. Last week we were talking in the last part of chapter 3 how, how John's disciples were re getting a little upset because Jesus' people were baptizing also and taking some of the business away from John's and John's going, it doesn't matter. It's all about the kingdom. And I thought this was a neat little side note that John the Evangelist gives us. Jesus himself did not do the baptizing. Only his disciples. We're not going to delve into the theological implications of that. I just thought it was a neat little side note. And all this is happening down in Judea, around Jerusalem. And Jesus decides to leave to go to Galilee. If we remember in the Gospels, I've talked about this a couple times, that Matthew, Mark, and Luke really talk about Jesus' ministry in Galilee. That's their primary focus. The Gospel of John talks a lot about Jesus' ministry in Judea and around Jerusalem. But we have a moment here where he says Jesus is going to leave and he's going to go back to Galilee. And it says here, and he had to pass through Samaria. Now this is an interesting choice of words as we're about to see here in a moment. He did not have to pass through Samaria to get to Galilee. It just happened to be the most direct route. And it's the one that he chose to do. And so when he says Jesus had to, it's not so much as going that he was compelled to do it as Jesus is going, I got to go this way. Jesus had purpose. Jesus had direction in going through Samaria. And we're going to look at this in a second. He comes to this small town in Samaria called Sychar near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, and this is interesting, wearied as he was from his journey, was tired. He's walking. 
There wasn't a whole lot of great transportation. He couldn't hop on the bullet train and get from Jerusalem to Galilee in 40 minutes. He was walking. He's going to be walking for days. And Jesus is wearied and he's sitting by the well. And this is a really neat well because it's Jacob's well. It's Jacob's well. We'll talk about that in a minute. And it was about the sixth hour. And in Hebrew reckoning, this means noon. It was the heat of the day. It was hot. The sun was out and it was beating down. So here's a little map to give you just a little bit of background. And we're going to give you a little bit of history. Just a little bit of history. David became king of Israel somewhere around 1000 BC. And he built this incredible kingdom that encompassed everything you see from here in Galilee all the way down here into Judea. The capital of the kingdom was Jerusalem. It was this incredible, wonderful, strong place. And it continued to expand under the first part of Solomon's reign. You know, in Solomon, we know the story about Solomon and his great wisdom and the two women and the babies and, and coming to him and, and all the great things he did. And, and we understand that. And sometimes we skip over the fact that the last half of Solomon's reign wasn't so good. He got involved in a lot of things he shouldn't have been involved in. But this kingdom of Israel grew and grew and grew. But when Solomon died around 922 B.C., his son Jeroboam comes to power. And Jeroboam just messed the whole thing up in so many ways. We talked through on our Wednesday nights about how the covenants through the years, how the people of Israel violated the covenants and done things against it and how God's judgment is coming on them. And, and, and under Jeroboam, the kingdom got divided into two parts. It got divided into two parts, Judah in the south and Israel in the north. And so basically, everything from here down became one kingdom, and everything from here up became another kingdom. And the capital of that northern kingdom was a city called Samaria. And this is where we're going to find it. And what happens is about 722, God's judgment comes against that northern kingdom. And the Assyrians come in and they conquer that northern kingdom. They scatter people all over the world at that time. And some Jews are left behind and then the Assyrians bring in people from other areas. And then the Jews that are left behind begin to intermarry with these other people that have come in and from other nations and stuff that are there and and. and Judah continues to exist as a kingdom, but Samaria, everything around Samaria becomes this, this mixture of people from all over the world. And they become to be called the Samaritans. And the people in Judah start to despise them. Cher had an old song long time ago about her background and her heritage called Half-Breed. You know, some of you may remember that. It says, that's all I ever was. Both sides were against me since the day I was born. And it's kind of what happens here. The, the Jews of Judah kind of look down on the people of Samaria. And that whole region becomes Samaria, and the people there become Samaritans. In fact, they were so despised. They were so despised by the Jews by the time of Jesus' day that instead of, if a, if a Jew had to go to Galilee, they wouldn't go through Samaria. They'd go up as far as they could, right around Jericho, Ephraim, and then they would cross the Jordan River to the east. And then they would walk all the way up until they got beyond Samaria and go back across the Jordan into Galilee. Can you imagine? Let's just add to this 80 mile journey, let's just add another 60 miles. Let's add another three days of walking. Let's add all this other work. And they would do that. And Jesus, in this story, the scripture says, had to go through Samaria. That's because of his choice. He said, I'm going right through the heart of it. And he says, I'm going to Galilee and I'm going right through there. And he comes to this little town. You can see it right here. Sychar is right here. And look on either side. There's these two mountains here. Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim. And they're going to be important in our story here in just a few minutes. And so they go and Jesus walks there and he comes to this place. And the story tells us that he gets there and he's sitting beside the well. This is a place where Jacob has given years ago, had given this area to his son Joseph and his well was there and he had fed his flocks and he'd fed all these other things and Jesus comes there and settles there. And what we're going to find in this first part of the story is that Jesus' love just absolutely knows no geographical bounds. In fact, Jesus has purpose in his trip to Samaria. Second thing we're going to find in this story, and this was probably the original thing I was going to talk about, is Jesus seeks the outcast. Jesus has a love for those that the world looks down on. The world tends to glorify the rich and the famous. 
And Jesus tends to glorify anyone who will come to him and love him. And I'm kind of glad about that too. It's a huge, huge amen. And he's there. And a woman from Samaria came to draw water. So here's two things going on here. Actually three. One, this woman is coming to draw water in the middle of the day. Now, the women would go draw water a lot of times. But you know when they would do it? Early in the morning. This woman, for whatever reason, couldn't go early in the morning. Couldn't be there with the other women. Couldn't be part of the group. There was something about her life that she had to go in the middle of the day to draw water because she couldn't be around the other women. There's something going on. She's been outcast by her own people right there. And she comes there. But now we've got this. And, and, and it wasn't a, a true Jewish man would not speak to a woman in public for the most part in those days. Wouldn't Just wouldn't. You would go out of your way to avoid them. <laughs> One guy talked about the, the, the bruised and bleeding Pharisees who used to walk down the street and they'd cover their eyes or they'd see a woman so they wouldn't talk to her and then they'd run into things and they'd get bruised and bleeding all over. I don't know if that's true or not. But there was this avoidance of these conversations in public that would seem inappropriate. And then you add to the fact that this woman was where? From where? Samaria. And the Samaritans were despised by the Jews. And she comes to draw water. And so we have this outcast. And Jesus is sitting there and he looks at her and he says, Hey, give me a drink. Now, Jesus was plenty capable of getting his own water. Let's not be confused by that. If Jesus really wanted some water, he could have reached into the well and got himself some water. It wasn't his purpose for being there. His purpose for being there was for that woman in that moment. And for us, 2,000 years later, to understand. And he looks at him and he says, give me a drink. His disciples weren't there. They'd gone away to the city to buy food. So you wonder, how does John write this story? Well, we're going to find out later that this Samaritan woman is going to share this story with everybody. And tell everybody about it. And the woman looks at him and says, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? Now she's shocked. She's come there, here's this Jewish man, he's obviously Jewish, sitting there. What's he doing in Samaria? And why is he asking me for a drink? Why does he need help from me? And Jesus is seeking out this outcast, this woman that has this life that, that is just not good. And it's hard. It's this woman who's missing something, who needs something in her life, but she doesn't know what it is and she hasn't been able to find it. And then we go on with the story and we find out that Jesus offers to her, just as he offers to every person today, something new and something different, something that she's never imagined possible before. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Jesus isn't even worried about getting a drink for himself, is he? He separated that out already. He used that as the way to start the conversation is to get in. And he says to this woman, if you knew who was sitting here talking to you, if you knew who I was, you would have asked and I would have given you living water. Now living water is an interesting phrase here. And it's a phrase used at this time that really referred to water that came from some type of spring, some type of water that bubbled up. It was a common usage. It wasn't an unknown usage. You had still water that laid there, lakes, oceans, rivers, and stuff. But it, when you would find a spring or a well where it would bubble up, they would actually refer to that water as living water, water that was moving, water that had something to him. And Jesus said, you know what? If you'd have really known here, it wouldn't have been me asking you for the drink. You would have been asking me for the living water. And the woman said to him, sir, you don't even have anything to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where are you getting living water from? And she's thinking very literally, where are you getting water from? Living water, bubbling water, you don't have anything to get it with. How are you going to do that? Are you greater than Jacob, our father? He gave us the well, he drank from it himself as did his sons and his livestock. Now, Jesus right here could easily have gone, yep, I'm greater than Jacob, your father, I'm the God of Jacob. But he didn't. He stayed with it. The woman is taking things very literally, and, and this this... This woman thought Jesus was telling her maybe about a nearby active spring or something that were there. And, and 
and, 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 and she brings forth this idea that this well comes from their father Jacob. You see, most Samaritans trace their ancestry back, even though they weren't exactly right about it all the way back, they would chase their ancestry back to Jacob. And say they came from Jacob and Joseph and Joseph's two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, and say that's where they came from. And, th- and there was within the Samaritan mindset some, some theological issues and problems where things weren't quite right, they weren't quite true. But, but she believed as a Samaritan that everything goes back to Jacob, and Jacob is this great leader of all the people, and she doesn't even know she's talking to the God of, of Jacob, and Jesus doesn't say, yeah, I'm greater than them. He, he, he wants her to understand something about herself. And Jesus doesn't want to get into this theological debate with her. And so Jesus said to her, look, everyone who drinks of this water, and I, and I agree with what I heard somebody say in the last week or two, probably just pointed at the well. He says, everybody who drinks of this water It's going to be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And it's a pretty incredible claim if you're talking about regular water. It's a pretty incredible claim to say that, that you will never be thirsty again. And people sometimes like to talk about, oh, what's that old song that says, ba 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 bubbling Bub, 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 bub. Jesus' love is bubbling in my soul and it's the whole idea of this living water is just bubbling up inside of us and bubbling up inside of us and, and we can sing all this but the focus isn't on the water the focus is on what happens when we get what Jesus gives to us if we read this story correctly and, and it's not about this water because Jesus says that the water that I give him will become in him a spring of water welling to eternal life in other words Jesus says whatever I give you Whatever you get from me, it's not about the water. It's about what happens because of it. And what happens because of it is life and life eternal. It's a theme that is going throughout the Gospel of John. Whosoever believeth in me shall not perish but have everlasting life. And Jesus says, I want to give you something that is is the focus of everything. I want to give you eternal life. And, and the heart of this conversation is about this deep longing of life that this world cannot satisfy. There is nothing this world can give us that can satisfy. But when we, what we long for is what we were created for, eternal life and fellowship with God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. And we are empty without it. And we long for something that we cannot put into words. And Jesus is trying to get this woman to understand, I want to give you you something that brings life to you that is eternal and restores your fellowship with God forever and ever and ever. And the woman says to him, sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. And she's still thinking about, man, I just want something to take care of what's here on earth. And Jesus is wanting to go so much deeper with her. He's wanting to go, I want to get to your very soul. And Jesus knows our every detail in life. Everything about us, Jesus already knows. And Jesus is going, how can I get this woman to understand that what I want for her is a living water that brings eternal life. I want her to come to a point where she will take what I give her and that she will enjoy fellowship with me forever. And so Jesus says, I know how to get to her. He says, I'm going to do this. Jesus said to her, go and call your husband and come here. Now there's some good stuff here, there's some propriety there, there's some things where Jesus is going, as a, as a Jewish man, I want to make sure we do this right. Go get your husband. Call. But, but what, what we know is that Jesus knew all about this woman. And the woman answered him and said, I have no husband. Now she was just going to leave it right there. Jesus said, go call your husband. The woman says, I have no husband. And Jesus says, you're right. You're right. You've had five and the one you have now is not your husband. And what you have said is true. We don't know all the story behind it. We know that she's outcast by the community in which she's in. We know that she's living with someone who's not her husband. We know that she's had five husbands. The assumption we make is that she has been searching for something over and over and over again in her life and hasn't found it. And she can't find it. And she doesn't know how to find it. And she's still looking for it. And Jesus goes, I know. I know everything about your life. I know every longing that's inside of you. I know every desire that's inside of you. And he's telling this woman, I got something better for you. 
I got something to fulfill the emptiness, to, to give you. Jesus, Jesus isn't being mean. He just wants to tell her, look in the mirror. Look in the mirror. See the reflection. See, we don't want to see the reflections of ourselves. I don't. I don't want to see the reflections of myself. I don't want to see the, the reality of what's inside of me. I surely don't want to hear what the Bible says sometimes about truth that contradicts what I do in my life. We don't want to be made to look at ourselves. And he's saying to this woman, I already know. I already know who you are, where you've been, and the journey you've traveled. And in this last section of the story, we're going to find out that Jesus is worthy of worship because of who he is. And the woman, instead of addressing these issues that Jesus raised, said, hey, I perceive that you're a prophet. So she deflects from it. I don't want to talk about my life. I don't want to talk about these people that, are, that have been in and out. I don't want to talk about our... So, Sir, you're a prophet. So um, our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. And we do the same thing. We don't want to look at our reality, so we deflect to the theological issue. We deflect to something new. And what she's talking about here is, let's talk about something that has nothing to do with me. Jesus knows her, and, and, and she doesn't like that. You've been looking at it over and over and over again, and we talk about these two mountains that were there, Ebal and Gerizim. When Moses was commanding the people about going into the promised land, and you understand Moses never got to go in. People entered under Joshua. He said, but when you get there, you're going to get to this valley that's between Ebal and Gerizim. And from Ebal, what I want you to do is stand and read all the curses that are in the law. And from Gerizim, I want you to stand and read all the blessings that are in the law. He says, when you get there, and, and, and she's saying, we came in Gerizim, this place right here, right next to Samaria, and right next to Sychar, this, this place that is on Samaritan soil is a blessed place. And we, the Samaritans, Jesus, we say that's where we worship God because that's where his blessings come from. And you people say it's in Jerusalem. And she's deflecting from her own self to this theological issue. And Jesus looks at her and says, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain or in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. Jesus says, that's nice, you're trying to deflect. But those things ultimately are not where we're going to worship the Father when it's all said and done. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know. Salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. God says, let me, Jesus says this, well, let me tell you something. You're asking the wrong questions. It's about worshiping the Father in spirit and truth wherever you are and whoever you are. And guess what? The Father is seeking out you to do it. And Jesus says, I've come here to seek out you because I want to give you something of such great value and worth that all these other things that you don't even want to think about won't even matter anymore. And you will see me for who I am and you will worship me for who I am. And God is spirit and people must worship him in spirit and in truth. And, and, and it's like you look at it and in some ways the Jews never worshipped God in spirit. They worshipped him because of the places where they were and the things that they did and the rituals they kept. And it's like the Samaritans sometimes didn't understand how to worship in truth because they made up these stories about their background and where they were from. And Jesus is saying none of that matters. It's about the one who is right here in front of you. And the woman goes on. And, and I'm going to skip that part. I'm come back to that. And the woman says to him, I know that Messiah is coming. The one who is called Christ. And when he comes, he will tell us all these things. He will explain it all to us. And Jesus looks at her and says, I'm here. It's me. And he looks at this woman and he says, wherever your life has been, whatever it has been, I have come here today. I had to come here today to tell you that no matter what your life has been like, no matter where it is, I am seeking you. To come, to worship me, to enjoy fellowship with me forever, to have a life that is satisfied and fulfilled because you will see yourself in light of the way I love you and nothing else will ever matter again and you will worship me in spirit and in truth. And I think that's an incredible thing he did. The great gospel writer, excuse me, the great letter writer Paul 
tells us a little later in, in Romans how we actually worship in spirit and truth. He says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Paul's telling us, wherever you are, true worship is being there, and true worship is spirit and truth. And, and spirit and truth worship comes from presenting your bodies, presenting everything that you are as a sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. And it's what Jesus is saying to this woman this day in Samaria. He's saying, I want you to come, and I want you to worship in spirit and truth, and I want you to give yourself up for me because I have sought you out today, and I've made this trip just for you to tell you that you are loved. Next week, we're going to see the balance of that story. We're going to see what it does in this woman's life when she realizes that here is somebody who really, really loves me. But for today, we're going to stop right there with the understanding that Jesus had to make this trip because he had to go to an outcast and he had to say to her, I am here and I have something for you that's beyond anything you could ever imagine that will fulfill every longing of your life. And I have sought you out so that you can come and worship me and fellowship with me forever. And he tells that to her and he tells that to us 2,000 years later because it's exactly the same for each and every one of us. Lord, we come today and we pray that we believe. We pray that we believe because of what you have done and the example you have set. In Jesus' name, amen. As we come to sing our final song, just remember, Jesus' love has no geographical boundaries. Jesus looks for the outcast. Jesus gives us something new and wonderful and different, knows every detail of our life. And because of what he offers us, because of who he is, he is worthy of our worship and our praise. And we need him more than we could ever imagine. I think first and last.